very, very good music. Tanto, that was for you. <laughs> good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. Can you still well, take it away, please? Yes, yes. Thank you very much for this very good music. Uh, once again, today we meet uh, uh, just to not delay things. Uh, for those who never attended this this informal, very relaxed uh, uh, meeting where we we normally ask someone to present or to strike a conversation about his own paper or some new ideas that you may have read somewhere and uh, you would want to tell us about it. Really, it came about because we never talk about what we read and uh, sometimes you learn from someone and also most people published and they really never get an opportunity to talk about their their own uh, research and stuff like that. So last week we had a very nice talk and I must say I learned a lot about uh, ocean biology and some of the important parameters that control whatever happens there, the conditions there. So I really, really was very happy to be exposed to such a topic. And today we have an atmospheric science, uh, atmospheric science uh, presentation. Uh, we will have Unati. Uh, Unati is working here at the University of Zulen. And he is starting his PhD now. And this is actually this was that he will strike a conversation about today is part of his uh, PhD project. And um, Nati will be summarizing these four papers that he listed here. I hope you received the advert. And um, uh, we will be talking about cut of flows today. Something that most of us really like to hear is Nati here. Please Nati, you can start sharing your, your screen. And, just to remind you again, this is a very informal talk. This is not to say you Nati is coming here to, to, to give a talk and, and scientific this and that. He's really coming here to strike a conversation about cut of flows. We have several questions that we have about cut of flows, especially the physics of it and so on. And this uh, is now an opportunity for us to meet some of the experts on cut of flows who can comment. And, and contribute in whatever way in terms of uh, dynamics and physics and cut of flow and so on. So, Nati, over to you. You can start to ignite this topic about cut of flows again. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kaniso, Dr. Kaniso Bata. Thank, uh, thank you, Dr. Nevel, as well. Uh, and I hope I'm audible enough for everyone to hear. And, and yeah, yes, so as, thank you. Okay, thank you. So as I've been introduced, my name is Nati Kulu. I'm based at the University of Zululand under the Geography and Environmental Studies Department, which is where I'm based. And I hope I will be able to strike a conversation which will also assist me in a way with, 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 with ideas going on forward with regards to my PhD and my PhD will be basically focusing on this weather system, which is a, a major part or a major contributor when it comes to extreme weather events or weather patterns that can occur over, over our country. So I will not go into the physics, the deep, deep physics as have been warned by Dr. Never to try and be relaxed and and talk about stuff that everyone can, can, can understand so that we can strike a conversation and not leave anyone behind. So my PhD will mainly focus on a downstream development of this weather system and also modeling, looking at how we can improve modeling models such as the CCAM and models such as WAF and, and, and try and compare their skill and see how we can improve them going on forward. Uh, in just in, in, in a nutshell, that's what my PhD will be focusing on. But coming back to the topic is uh, uh, what we will be focusing on is basically everything, and I hope it's going to be everything that we need to know about cutoff flows. So I wanted us to start with a general discussion 
uh, when we speak about climate change or when we speak about global warming, uh, the numbers are there. The numbers are there, the records are there. And I wanted to highlight this, that the past seven years have been ranked one of the top seven hottest years uh, uh, when we speak about the records, when we, when we started record. And this is, this is well-known information. And 2016 has been ranked as number one. Uh, having about one degrees above average, uh, degrees Celsius average uh, temperature. With 2020, which is the year that we are just coming from, we know that it came with a lot of uh, 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 difficulties in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, we need, we need to note that 2020 is now ranked as number two when it comes to the hottest years uh, uh, ever recorded. And you can see that this century uh, was, 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 was really, a, 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 it needs to be noted when it comes uh, to climate sciences, when it comes to global warming and also climate change. And again, I wanted us to understand why is it important to study the weather? Why do we need to understand uh, the distribution of precipitation? Why do we need to understand the distribution uh, of temperature and other parameters that we can, uh, that we have in climate science? For example, if you look at these figures, uh, the three figures that I've highlighted here. The first one uh, is DJF, which is our austral summer rainfall, which is on my left. And then we also have vegetation, uh, which is the greenness, uh, showing the greenness over Southern Africa. And we also have population distribution uh, over, over our subcontinent. As you can see, if you look at the rainfall, you can see that the distribution of rainfall, if you come down to South Africa, you can see that it increases as you move from West going into the East. And if you go again to the vegetation diagram, you'll also see that the distribution of vegetation in a way, in a general way does follow the distribution of precipitation. As you can see that it also increases as you move away uh, from the dry areas in the West going on to the East. And again, people will want to reside where the resources are, where there's natural resources, where there is rainfall, where there's water availability and other natural resources. As you can also see that the distribution of population also follow these two parameters. And this is very interesting in terms of understanding the distribution of people, the distribution of, of climate conditions and vegetation and how these tend to talk to each other and, and, and interrelate and have an interrelationship of some sort. So when we speak about South Africa, what are our major weather producing systems? We know that we have cold fronts and uh, the access community will know that because they are based in Cape Town, they will know that during Austral winter, this is where this, this weather system are more devastating, where they tend to penetrate more in the interior and affect uh, the places such as Cape Town and other places in the Western Cape. We also have tropical cyclones uh, that tend to affect us in austral summer. And most importantly, when we have La Nina conditions, and I will touch into that, what do, what do I mean when I speak about El Nino and also what do I mean when I speak about La Nina? So you find that we also had tropical cyclones and you might remember in 2019, we had tropical cyclone Nadia and also had tropical cyclone Kenneth, uh, those, are types of, of the weather systems that also uh, produce weather rainfall over our region. We also have cloud bands, the extension from the ITCZ up until uh, the regions where you have cold fronts in the mid latitude. We also uh, have the, the migration of ITCZ, which also plays a vital role in terms of producing a uh, rainfall uh, over, over our regions. We also have localized thunderstorms. And again, we have my favorite, which are subtropical anticyclones. We know that on the Atlantic, we have uh, the St. Helena High, the Atlantic Ocean, we have the St. Helena High. And when we come to the Indian Ocean, the warm Indian Ocean, the Southwest Indian Ocean, we have uh, the Mascarene High. And these weather systems tend to play a vital role uh, in terms of the west to its propagation of weather systems over our region, over our subcontinent. And then comes the one that we will deal uh, in detail about, which is the cutoff lows. And we will refer to cutoff lows as, as COLs for, for the purpose of, of this presentation. We will deal with the abbreviation COL. So our focus is on the last one, which I've put there in the list, which is uh, the cutoff lows. So let us start by identifying our region. 
uh, in terms of topography, uh, we know that most of our high-lying areas are found as you move towards the interior. And topography plays a vital role uh, in, terms of, in terms of rainfall distribution, in terms of penetration of weather systems, for example, such as tropical cyclones uh, and, 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 uh, and other weather systems. So you find that topography tends to play a vital role in terms of distribution of weather events over our country or our subcontinent. And as you can see in this figure that as you move towards the interior, this is where topography tends to sit on, 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 on a higher level compared to the coastal areas, which is sitting just uh, in, the mean, in, the mean, in the mean, in the averages uh, of the sea level. That is the, and we know that we have areas such as Mozambique, which are low-lying areas, which is why tropical cyclones, for example, are able to penetrate uh, over this region and then able to affect countries such as South Africa, Mozambique, uh, Zimbabwe, and, and other nearby uh, countries that are there. So you find that the, the topography plays a vital role in terms of such penetration uh, and also the distribution uh, of weather events over over our country or our subcontinent. So what are cutoff lows? Uh, and I've tried to have the best or the uh, a definition which can be understood by people who are non-scientists and also a definition which can, which can be understood by people who are, who are into climate science. So I hope uh, the definition which I've chosen because there's a variety of this definition in literature a, 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 a which, which exists. So cutoff lows, a, this is a deep low pressure system that is strongest in the mid troposphere. And we use the steering levels at about 500 hectopascals. So it's when you move to the surface, we identify them at the mid troposphere. So we call this weather event as a mid tropospheric weather system. So it is the upper air system that tends to separate from the principal westerly flow of the mid latitude. As I said before, that there is that westerly flow, there is that westerly wave that tends to exist of weather events moving from the west going to the east. So you find that there is an occurrence uh, of that cutoff from the westerly flow, uh, which creates this weather event known as cutoff flows. So it is a low pressure system that is separated now from this planetary circulation. And then it spins off independently and is now no longer linked to the westerly flow. How is it identifiable? This weather system is identifiable because it loses its momentum uh, as it locates over a region for a period uh, of about six days, a maximum of about six days. And it propagates slowly before it dissipates. So it is a quasi-stationary weather system because it propagates very slowly as it tends to locate over a certain region. And you find that the Mascarin High, which is sitting over the Indian Ocean, also plays a vital role in terms of the blocking and the slow propagation of this weather system. And again, we need to note that there is a link between a region high on the near surface and the occurrence of cutoff flows. So cutoff flows are linked with instability in the mid troposphere. So the mid troposphere is our main indicator when you speak about cutoff flows. We go up there and use 500 hectopascals at about 500 hectopascals, which is the mid troposphere. And then we say, this is where we are identifying this weather system. And it is associated with very deep convection. And it is likely to bring extreme weather events events such as flooding, flash flooding, and events such as snowing uh, in some instances. So you find that cutoff flows over South Africa are preceded by downstream development. And this is widely covered uh, in the Dakana, I think, and, and war, war paper 2010, uh, the, the issue of downstream, downstream development of this weather system. And this paper also find out that 89% of cutoff flows uh, in the Southern Hemisphere are associated with what we call uh, the Rossby wave breakings. So there are those Rossby waves which are there. And it, with, if you have keen interest, you can go and, 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 and read on this paper uh, whereby they've 
identified this, that 89 of these uh, cuts of flows associated with the Rose Bay breaking event. And we also find that 11% of cuts of flows are also linked with the intrusion of what we call a, 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 a potential a, a vorticity anomalies, uh, which tend to exist there uh, when these events uh, tend to occur. So I, I will not go into detail because I understand this is a diverse community. Uh, and we also need to note that cut of flows, uh, they tend to occur more frequently during the colder months, during the, 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 the colder months. And as I said before, they are linked to severe weather, heavy rainfall, extreme cold condition, uh, such as snowfalls, uh, uh, and also flooding uh, in some instances. And this is mainly due to its nature, to its characteristics of having a deep moist conviction uh, happening when, when it does okay. And why is it important for communities? Why is this important for society? And it's because it comes with a lot of disruption in terms of economic, it can halt economic activities. It can cause damage to infrastructure and understanding and focusing on cut of flow is not only for the importance of the climate community, but it's also important uh, for the society, the community, which needs this uh, forecasting information on the ground. So, this is a schematic diagram which is showing if you see below, this is the near surface where, where, where we are. And then when you go up uh, at about 500, you can see that these weather systems are tilting towards the equator. That is how weather systems tend to behave. As you go up the atmosphere towards the troposphere, you find that these weather systems tend to tilt with height. As you can see that uh, there is a high which is sitting in the Atlantic Ocean. And again, there's a high which is sitting on the Indian Ocean. Those are the two highs uh, I was speaking about. And the movement of this uh, wave is from west to east. And as you can see there, this diagram is trying to show you how the low pressure system will look at the surface and how it would look if you are sitting at 500 hectopascals, which is in the mid troposphere. And as you can see that on, 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 on the other side of the, of the weather system, you can see that there is convergence happening on the low and then it goes up. And then on the side of the St. Helena high, you can see that there is associated divergence. And so there's a lot of dynamics which tends to play a role uh, in the occurrence of this weather system. And again, we spoke about that Mascarena high, which is sitting over the Indian Ocean, as you can see there, near Madagascar, uh, you find that there is this blocking which is caused by the masculine high. So you find that this blocking triggers a stagnation and cause the quasi-stationary propagation of this weather system. Uh, and it this enhances the formation of the cutoff flow, uh, which I've explained that tends to spin independently from the westerly flow that I've mentioned from the previous figure. And when the cutoff flow is fully developed, it will now circulate independent, independently, uh, causing additional blocking from the already existing blocking of the mascarine high. And while it does such, uh, it causes a quasi-stationary west to east tracking, causing very unsettled and extreme weather over the subcontinent uh, for an extended period of time. And we said that for about six days, a maximum of about six, three, a minimum of about three to about a maximum of six days. And what are the characteristics that are associated uh, with cutoff lows when, when we look at them? And our main focus is on the Southern Hemisphere. As you can see that areas over South Africa, South America and Australia are the regions which are mostly affected by this weather system in the Southern Hemisphere. And then they occur in the mid latitude of about 20 and 45 south. Uh, and their depth within the southern hemisphere tend to extend from the upper level down to the lower levels of the atmosphere. So it's an extension of some sort. Uh, what are the low level systems associated with this in the southern hemisphere? Uh, it's surface low or a cold front. Uh, and in many instances, it is possible that you have a reaching high. So a reaching high will occur when this 
mass current high, which is now sitting on the in the in the ocean, was moving over land, and then it causes that ridge because it will sit and then cause that ridge. And what does this ridge uh, uh, influence? It influence uh, the transportation of moisture from the warm Indian Ocean because we know that anticyclones tend to rotate uh, in an anticlockwise uh, manner in the southern hemisphere. So it will bring moisture from the warm Indian Ocean uh, onto onto the plateau onto the plateau. So we find that a reaching high plays a vital role in the development or in the persistence of this weather system or and then the average number of these weather systems per annum, so they occur throughout the year. Cutoff flows tend to occur throughout the year. So we have about 40 of these, and we have similarities. What are the similarities between the two hemispheres uh, when the cutoff flows tend to occur? We know that they tend to move from west to east, they propagate from west to east, uh, and they are called cold weather system. Uh, they are called cold, and they also move from west, which those are similarities that we tend to find between the Southern Hemisphere occurrences and the Northern Hemisphere occurrences of cutoff lows. As you can see, uh, this is a figure which is uh, cited from uh, Singleton and Risen 2007. Uh, you can see that the peak of this weather system usually occurs around May. So they maximize around uh, March, April and May which is the autumn season in South Africa. And they also tend to peak uh, in, in September, October, November. So you can see that they, yes, we agree that they occur throughout the year, but their peak is found uh, in the autumn season during March, April, May. So now we have now understood the climatology. We have now understood the patterns associated with cutoff lows. Now let us go to a, a familiar case study, which is covered in, the paper which was shared by, by Neville, which was done by Moobe et al, published in 2020, which was also an interesting case. So we've taken one case from there and then we'll talk about it here. It is a case which happened in 2019 where part of areas in KZN, in Durban, areas in Guamash, areas in Umlaz and Amanz in Dot were majorly affected uh, in April, 2019. So we, now let's try and understand that the 2018-2019 season was a, an El Nino season. And I did mention that I will speak about what we mean by ENSO, which is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we find that uh, the occurrences or sea surface temperatures that are found over the equatorial Pacific, when they tend to maximize over the whole region of the equatorial Pacific, uh, they tend to alter the circulation of what we know as the Walker circulation over many regions in the globe, because you find that the whole region in the equatorial Pacific will have high sea surface temperatures, and this will relocate uh, the positioning uh, of, 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 of subsidence, uh, the positioning and also of, of convergence will tend to occur along what we call the Walker circulation. And this tends to affect us over Southern Africa because we find that when we have an El Nino happening in the equatorial Pacific, our areas are usually associated with what we call subsidence. So in most cases, but not all, you find that when we're having an El Nino occurring over the equatorial Pacific, it is most likely that it is going to be dry over, over Southern Africa. So you find that there's subsidence associated with this. And again, when we have La Nina, when we have La Nina, when now the sea surface temperatures, not the whole portion uh, of the equatorial Pacific does not have warm sea surface temperatures, but only a small portion does, uh, you find that such is linked with us having frequent cyclogenesis happening over the warm Indian Ocean. And we have affected, and we, have, we get affected by penetration and landfalling of tropical cyclone in most uh, occasions. So you find that, uh, 2018, 2019 season was an unusual season in terms of that you had in April, you had a cut of flow affecting areas in Durban and you also had TCs, tropical cyclones forming. As you might remember, we had tropical cyclone Idaya and also had tropical cyclone uh, Kenneth. And surprisingly, this 
uh, was, 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 was an El Nino. So this leaves a gap, it leaves a discussion in terms of, of research question, exploring uh, more about this. So I would leave that open that, and say 2018, 2019 was an unusual season, leaving a gap for such. As you can see uh, at the higher levels at about 500, because we use 500 uh, on the 24th of April, you can see that the cutoff law was already developed over South Africa. It was already developed uh, over South Africa. And then it flooded regions over KZN and some parts of Eastern Cape, but KZN was largely affected. There were landslides, there were uh, damages uh, to river banks and some rivers collapsed, some buildings uh, collapsed, some buildings uh, collapsed, and there was about an estimated 200 millimeters uh, of rainfall in, 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 in 24 hours, which is a lot of rainfall being dumped over a, a region uh, in such a short period of time. Uh, and we had about 85 people who died uh, with many being left homeless. So you can see that understanding the focus of such and improving the skill of forecasting such weather system is important because uh, the loss of one life is one too many. So you can imagine having about 85 people dying uh, with many being homeless uh, is, 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 is devastating. And this weather event had a repair cost of a, an estimated 650 million due to the damage it caused in terms of water pipes, health facilities, uh, and, and uprooted electrical supply. And these are just images of the impact uh, which, which, which occurred. And you can see that there was destruction to, to households. Uh, I'm sure many of you saw this on TV, even to roads and, and infrastructure uh, happening. So you can see that this was really a devastating, uh, you, as you can see, it was really a devastating period uh, uh, brought, brought by uh, this weather system. And then now we are going to the forecasting part. And this is the paper I spoke about, which was published uh, last year, which was uh, uh, forecasting uh, intense cut of flows uh, using the UM model, the 4.4 uh, unified model. And it was published last year. So what did this paper focus on? Now we are focusing on, on, forecasting, on forecasting this thing which happened in April. So this paper was there to evaluate the 4.4 UM model, uh, which is being currently used by the South, Af South African Weather Service to simulate uh, daily rainfall. So this weather system is currently, I mean, sorry, this model is currently op operational within the weather system. And now let's compare and see how the finding of this paper was. So you find that circulation variables such as precipitation, that is simulated by the UM model were compared uh, with the ECM WF's error interim reanalysis precipitation. So we compare reanalysis data and model data to see if the skill of this weather uh, model was able to predict and focus uh, 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 the positioning, the center position of this weather system, and also the amount of rainfall which was to be done by this uh, weather event. So you find that the findings of this paper, the major findings of, the, of this paper uh, was that the unified, the 4.4 unified model simulated precipitation differently during the different stages of the development and location of the system. So the skill of this weather system was able to simulate and say at the different stages of this development and occurrence of this weather system, this is the amount of precipitation that will occur. So how does this assist us? This assists us in terms of that when we understand the performance and limitation of the UM model, uh, we are able to improve the skill. If we are able to understand the gaps, then we are able to improve the skill. And also this will benefit severe weather forecasting and contribute uh, to, disaster risk, uh, to disaster risk reduction in South Africa and ensure that uh, we, save, we save lives. 
So you find that when we look at the development of this cut of flow, it was firstly identified uh, using geopotential heights, and we did say that we use 500 hectopascals, uh, and it was located over the western part of South Africa. And these are the different days. As you can see, there's the 22nd, the 23rd, and also uh, the 24th. And you can see this different, the, 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 there's the differences in terms of the location of this weather system as you move throughout this number of days. And you find that on the second day, the core of this weather system it was located now over the northern part and western part of South Africa. And then it shifted over the western part and central part of the country on the third day. And these are the observations which were there, which are there. And what are the models telling us? What did the model tell us? Uh, the UM model, which was used in this paper. So you find that the model was able to simulate the core of the system as observed. And then the heavy rainfall, which was associated with weather, this weather system and complex cumulus congestors uh, 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 was also observed. And the central part of the country, on the central parts of the country during the second day, but when we analyze, when they analyze the rainfall over the areas of deep convergence, the model tend to overestimate rainfall for about 10 and 5 millimeters for the first and the second day. While it overestimated about 50 millimeters on the last day. So you can see that there needs to be a, this model simulation improvement when you speak about the skill. As, 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 as crucial the forecasting was, uh, but the overestimation which was found by this paper is also crucial and important in terms of model development and improvement. And when we look at the convective and the non-convective schemes of the model, we find that the model was able to simulate a, a small fraction of convective precipitation that spread, uh, that was spreading along the Southeast coast uh, with none over the interior in most of the events, with high amount of rainfall uh, being from the non-convective uh, and dynamic uh, processes. So what are the key dis uh, discussions uh, rising from this? Uh, what, what are the key points that, that tend to arise from this? So you find that overall, the 4.4 uh, kilometer UM model was able to simulate the highest rainfall towards the east of the center as expected. The model was able to better simulate the location of the systems during their matured stages, which is good. And the model tends to pick up precipitation slightly early and short-lived when compared to the observations. And we also find that the model also underestimated the amount of rainfall when the system tends to transit over the eastern escarpment and coastal regions of the country. So the findings of this paper, again, can help model developers to identify areas that need improvement uh, for future updated uh, and, and uh, for future updated model skill. So again, an understanding of model strength, limitation and biases also helps forecasters to be able to be cautious when interpreting model output and generating forecast uh, such as and giving warnings for for the public. And again, uh, what needs to be discussed is what was unusual about the 2018-2019 El Nino season uh, that it deserves so much research. And I did mention the types of unusual weather occurrences that happened during uh, this El Nino 2018-2019 season. And in that regard, I would like to stop there. And I hope uh, I did not take enough time, uh, more time than allocated. Thank you again for the opportunity. And I hope I, I was able to strike a conversation with regards to, to cutoff laws. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Nati, for, for, for really starting this conversation. and. I must say, you can have a question here that can be directed to anyone, or you can start to add on, on what Nat is saying, uh, or if you think there's something that was too scientific for others, you can simplify it for them so, so that they understand where we are in terms of uh, the science of cut of laws and stuff like that. 
So do you have any, any questions, any comment? I have for myself, I can start commenting that I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm thinking about the, um, you know, the measurements that we have, the data that we have, and looking at the types of models that we do. Already, if I had an opportunity to do a PhD, I would, I would really go back and do modeling of uh, cut of flows using deep neural networks, uh, because I can see that, okay, there are models that are used, but uh, we have a lot of information data that has been collected already. And I think uh, if one wants to do a PhD, you can still you know, start thinking about using deep neural networks and feed in the types of data that we already have. If we start to see, uh, if we start to have this climatology of cut of loads and stuff like that, it means you can uh, already start to use, for instance, long term, long term, long term, short term memory neural networks and, and other types of neural networks really to learn the sort of patterns that uh, normally come with cut of loads, and then that could help you uh, predict or forecast cut of loads using deep learning. Okay, we have uh, one uh, question or comment uh, by uh, Bratando. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Nganyes. That was a very good uh, presentation, uh, uh, Nati, thank you. So the, the thing I want to raise is, is the issue of predictability um, of, of these systems, particularly at the medium range forecasting time scale. Um, we, 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 we can do very well uh, uh, in forecasting these systems as you demonstrated using models such as the UM and other sophisticated uh, uh, models uh, at, at, the, at the short range forecasting time scale up to, the, that would be uh, by definition uh, from the WMO uh, uh, up to about two days ahead. But when you look at, at these systems and 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 how and their predictability uh, at the at the seven day to ten day time scale, um, their, their their predictability might be might be a, a little bit difficult to to pin down there, and 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 it's very necessary to do this at that time scale because if you want to 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 uh, uh, produce early warning systems you you need those types of 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 lead times i just wanted to find from colleagues and and you nati as you were presenting how can we do this how can we improve the predictability of 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 these systems at the at that time scale you know bearing in mind that uh, there was something that the wmo developed i think a, a global program uh, called Topex. It was developed in in twenty in two thousand and four. It ran for about ten years, um, and then it 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 it, it, it concluded in twenty in twenty fourteen. What they thought about in that program was the involvement of things like dynamics um, at the, at those time scales uh, to 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 improve predictability of these systems and others. Uh, at the at the medium range time scale, do you think that is it possible to do these things in South Africa, or is it not? Anyone can really comment. Yes. Mm. If there's a gap in the conversation, it's never here. I'll jump in. Okay. I, I just want to say that um, this morning I attended a workshop which was run by um, uh, what well, was it was a joint effort with DIA, SOARS, and UCT CSEG, and they're planning um, a new platform for climate services which is kind of end to end. It starts with basic data, ends with a whole lot of applications. And I think this kind of work that, that's been done here is the kind of work that should find a place in the sort of edges of our capability of forecasting in medium term time, time ranges. I don't know what the time range is here, 
whether it's days, hours, days, weeks, uh, in terms of conditions suitable for these uh, cutoff lows. But any kind of predictability is some kind of predictability. So, I, so I'm just telling you about that. But also, I guess I, my question really is, what time scales are there in terms of seeing the signals for the formation of these systems? Can we see them days in advance, potentially? Let me just qualify that by saying, I've seen forecasts which say something like, the conditions are suitable for the formation of, let's say, uh, tornadoes. That doesn't mean that they're predicting a tornado, they're predicting conditions that are suitable for tornadoes. Similarly, for these kinds of extreme events, can we say conditions, we predict conditions are going to be suitable for the formation of cutoff lows? And at what time scale? Thanks. Yeah. Very good can, question. Can, yeah, can Hello, I jump in? My range. Oh. Okay. Yes, Marshall, okay, you can comment and then we can we can hear from uh, Bratando, okay? I don't know how to raise my hand here. Uh, I just, just following up on the thanks title for the good and thank you, thank you, Nati, for the interesting presentation. Uh, I, I think I'm sure we have some colleagues here from SOS, and the, uh, I think they've been doing a wonderful job, especially uh, considering all the challenges that come with the process of predicting uh, these systems. Um, my my idea is that I think it is possible uh, that we can do this kind of work here in South Africa and we can even take a leaf or lessons from some of the work that he was he driven or started off by you, you Tando and your, your group there. Uh, on the source side, I know I'm aware there are some, a number of models that are operational besides UEM, I don't know there's this other Cosmo and they also look to this ECMW. But some of the things that I, I would really think I was also pertinent is we need to also consider what is happening like these shifts that are happening in the recent years. Because we are only seeing not, not undermining the wonderful work that was done by Singleton and stuff for around more than 15 years ago. Maybe if we can also have a sort of a dissection like Decada or 5 to see what has really been happening with these cattle flows and the raging anticyclones. Is what is actually happening, how is the, our systems have been improving? And when we're analyzing, I'm not one fan of presentations whereby someone shows the rainfall amounts of the model. I really want sort of the, to look at the biases and all those other statistical aspects associated with these very various models so that we can at least try to quantify, magnify the signal noise and all those other things. I don't know how much work uh, SOS have been doing, but I know there is a, quite a lot of work as well that the colleagues there at SOS have been doing insofar as verifying analyzing and looking at the, these various models and how they are able to pick or predict some of these systems, especially at this short to medium range scale. Okay, I'll cut off for you for now. Okay, that's very good contribution, uh, Doka. I see Hector's hand is up. Can we start by Tando? I think he wanted to say something. And then Hector. Okay, thanks, Nganyus. I want to pick up on, on something that Neville said, um, which I think is critical, actually. I think that the issue of uh, predictability, given the conditions, we, we, you know, uh, looking at at, at how far into the future we would be able to see these systems, 
um, at the time scale of the sub seasonal to seasonal time scale. I think I'm not sure about this. I stand corrected. I'm just putting it out there. At the time scale beyond the uh, the predictability limit uh, from initial conditions, which would be uh, 10, anything from 10 days to 14 days, and then beyond that, I think the kind of forecast that you would produce uh, at that at that at that time scale, which would be your S two S, would be the type of forecast that Neville is talking about about conditions that might be conducive for cutoff flow uh, formation. But I do think that uh, at at time scales uh, uh, shorter than that, where where the, the, the prediction problem in the atmosphere is an initial value problem, which means. Uh, we produce forecasts on the basis of knowing what the state of the atmosphere is currently. Um, and, and, and I think cutoff flows can be, can be predicted at those time scales. We are talking about seven to 10 days uh, ahead of time. But what we have seen is that, okay, so to do this, you need to, to use an ensemble method. You, you need to use many models. That, that project into the future at those time scales. So what we have seen is that some in a particular on a particular case, for example, some model, some model ensemble members would see the cutoff flow and others would not see the cutoff flow. And so that that presents a lot of uncertainty and therefore dampens our ability to to, to predict the systems at that time scale. So what that means is that we need to have a uh, prior knowledge uh, about cutoff flows before they actually happen. What is What are the dynamical conditions or dynamical processes that precede them so that we can have a better understanding um, of, uh, of their predictability, you know, at, 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 at those uh, time scales, uh, which are seven to 10, to, to 10 days. Okay. Hector, I think something happened to Vatando there. Uh, okay. All right. Thank you, Kanyiso. Thank you, Nkosinati. Interesting presentation. Uh, interesting to see how a, a young boy who was in my first year class in 2011 has matured in the field. Uh, thank you very much. So. I, I found the I found the, the talk very interesting. I want to follow up on what Tando has just said. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, in response to to Neville, uh, in fact, there's one thing which needs to be highlighted as well in terms of forecasting. I'm an old forecaster myself, and so is Marshall, who is here, who just spoke. We were old forecasters. We were forecasting in the old days, in the 2000s, during the time of Aileen and, uh, and Jaffet and all that, and five years, those of you who are old enough to remember these events. Uh, so we are old forecasters. I was there uh, witnessing the transformation of forecasting during the introduction of the severe weather forecasting demonstration project in 2006, 2007. So I can see how models improved our ability to forecast in the region uh, with the introduction of ensembles, ensemble forecasting like uh, like Tando was saying. But one thing I need to highlight is the difference between weather systems of the mid latitudes and weather systems of the tropics. The predictability is different. I myself did quite a bit of tropical forecasting. I know that. And anyone who's believed in the tropics will know that weather, weather in the tropics is driven more by convection rather than by mass, which is pressure changes. Mm -hmm. Pressure changes that okay in the mid latitudes are more rhythmic. You have ridges and troughs moving there. And so you find that models tend to pick those uh, those rhythmic changes better than they would uh, the convection that dominates the tropical atmosphere. Uh, and so that's something that needs to be known. And uh, you would find someone who lives in Europe somewhere in the middle that she's finding that their models do very well there. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons, of course. And then, of course, there are also other things such as topography and so on, which come in. Uh, but yes, uh, models can be jumpy as well. I know this from experience. Uh, they can indicate uh, uh, that there is rain coming in four, it's four or five days, and then the next day you come, you see this is gone. And, and yes, 
so as Tando was saying, uh, that they can be jumpy, but the, the idea of end samples incre increases the confidence of, of the forecaster on the bench. Of course, ultimately, we used to teach our forecasters that it's not the model that forecasts the problem. The model is the forecast is generated by the forecaster, not, not necessarily the models themselves. Of course, the climatology, like Nati was, was presenting here, becomes very important. Do you know a climatology of cutoff laws and so on? Uh, one thing I thought Nati would have wanted to highlight also is the, the co-occurrence of uh, uh, cold fronts with, uh, with cutoff laws. It's happened. You know, we had a very severe winter, some, some severe episodes of, of winter, uh, especially in June 2020. Uh, which uh, there is a paper we are writing on, uh, which uh, some of you will recall, and we argue also in our paper that they could have limited movements of people and probably reduced the transmission of the coronavirus during those weeks when, when it was bitter cold, snowfalls, and, and so on. So there are times when you have a cutoff flow occurring uh, uh, together with a, with a cold front, and therefore the impact is much, uh, much more significant. I, I, I probably say too much now, I'll stop here, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I think Mary Jane wanted to say something too. Uh, yes, thank you, thank you Nkanyiso. Um, it's, this is a great initiative that, that you have started with, with Neville. Um, Nati, I, I enjoyed your, your presentation, it was, it was a really good one. Um, so when Marshall was commenting, I, I think he mentioned source, source a number of times. So I thought I should just raise my hand to talk to what we are doing at Source. Um, so so we, we, we are, we've got models that, that we are running locally, including the unified model that, that Nati um, discussed. But regarding the medium range that, that Tando spoke to, we are not running any local models because at that time scale, it's important that one runs a global model. Um, and what we do uh, up to about 14 days, we download the NCEP um, global and sample forecast system data. So it has got a number of, of members. So the issue of ensemble forecasting has already been mentioned. And out of that, the idea is that then you can just see, you can get an idea of, you know, whether there are systems that will be, you know, coming up or, or, or not. Uh, so it's just to provide a, an, an idea to the forecasters if, if there's going to be something that's coming. But in terms of what we issue going out of source, we don't go beyond seven days. So, so with the shorter time range, so, so from, from the NCEP, um, basically going over, we also use the ECMWF data. So ECMWF is actually known as the best model um, in the world right now. We've got a paper that's going to be published soon uh, with the South African Journal of Science where for the same case that Nati presented, we compared the ECMWF with the UM, um, the UM running with 1.5 kilometers um, and 4.4 kilometers grid length uh, compared to ECMWF, which has a lower resolution. We found ECMWF actually picked the location of the heavy rainfall better. Um, yes, and then with the shorter time scales, so now this is up to 48 hours with the unified model that uses a grid length of 1.5 kilometers and then up to 72 hours for the unified model that uses a grid length of 4.4 kilometers. So, so you can see, so our mode of working differs depending on, on basically the lead time that we are able to provide. So with the longer ones, as I mentioned, it's important that, that one uses global models. And then with the shorter range time skills, then it's important that one now starts use, using original models that can provide um, higher resolution we continue to see that the models really struggle when it comes to the location of, of the rainfall, like I mentioned. So with, with this particular event, uh, the unified model actually extended the heavy rainfall across the whole coast of, of KZN. Uh, we made simulations with WOF with high resolution again, and we found the same problem that the rainfall was just extended across the whole um, the, the whole um, coast of, of KZN. So, so we still have challenges as, as Nati has indicated. Um, 
so so there's improvement needed in the short range time scale itself as well as in the medium range um and in the medium range i think the way to go is going to be to kind of look at the way tando is working so i think some of you have seen his papers which try to look at the dynamics to understand what the processes are that are associated with these events and then to use that understanding to try and predict because like i said at source we've got we get data up to about 14 days ahead but but in terms of what we issue we don't say anything beyond seven days and that is simply because we we don't know what the skill is um at that time, time scale thank you okay that's very nice uh, thank you for your comment uh, mary jane and of course our time is we wish we had all the time and i think we can have a comment from one person other than me saying that every time i speak to patando he he leaves me with a lot of questions and I find, I, I find myself going back and having to see if I can try to meet some of his demands. Okay, and what, what we did is, recently what I did is I wanted to see Rosby waves inside the, inside, inside the cut of flow itself. And um, I've been doing that, trying to see if I can do that using Python here and uh, applying signal processing on zonal wind data because it's easy for me to see those rosby waves in the zonal wind data and because of the propagation of zonal wind of 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 of, 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 of rosby waves as well. So we may talk about that later. And I think we have one person who wants to comment. Uh, Ray, you want to say something? Mm, thank you. Uh, thank you, my brother. I I just wanted to comment, or maybe it's a question. I'm not necessarily scientifically trained as yet. I'm more of in the social sciences stream, and I'm thinking about the amount that Nati called out and said that you know when they quantified the damages that you know they incurred uh, monetarily, they amounted something to north of six hundred million or thereabout. And I cannot help but worry, you know, um, where does this money come from? Who funds these things? Uh, which would take me back to say that, are we able to then use this information, Nati and everybody that you are presenting to backtrack and maybe find um, um, in particular terms, which countries or which regions may have contributed largely to these effects that we are seeing? Besides the Donald Trumps that are signing themselves out of the Paris Agreement, of course, he has some nefarious intentions, I would, I would imagine. You know, uh, uh, through climate litigation, is it possible that we can find a way to get them to pay? Um, I, I don't know as yet how this would go about, but uh, science may be in a position to help us to be able to identify we are here because of this thing that has largely contributed to where we are now and it is us who have to you know suffer the financial consequences of the decisions that those countries or regions may have taken ignorantly to much to our disadvantage so can we use such information maybe in in in, in court at the tribunals at the commissions with the united nations and other relevant and uh, vest uh, parties that have vested interests to say that you know it is us who are going to be spending uh, millions, it is us who are going to be losing 80 people with each natural disaster that happens. So I don't know if my question or comment is, is clear. Can, can I jump in please, Chair? Yes, 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 yes. yes uh, we, we're technically out of time, so, uh, but if you can all hang on, as long as you can, then that would be great. There's no, there's no, uh, other reason for us to switch off other than we've scheduled this particular time. I'd, I'd like to address Ray's question, if I may, and just make the point that cutoff lows are not abnormal. Uh, they are normal events. And so there's nobody to blame for a cutoff low. Thanks, Mary Jane. I actually wanted to ask you a question, but I will catch you another time. And, and the question to you, Mary Jane, and perhaps others from source can answer it, Mary Jane's just said she has to leave, is, is why we don't do more operational stuff in the medium term. I accept the argument that there's a skill issue with the models, but um, nevertheless, 
we could have some sort of outlook, but that's another discussion. I want to get back to Ray's question. And in my view, um, I think that in order to be able to sue somebody, you have to be able to attribute the, um, the, the problem to some to something or someone. And that's the tragedy of the commons. You know, you, you, can't, you can't sue a country, you can try, but uh, you know, that doesn't work. Um, who do you sue? And so, you know, in a case like air pollution, for example, if there's a smokestack that you can go and measure the pollutants coming out of the smokestack and the person who lives nearby has died of a heart attack and you can go and make a case that they died because of that smokestack. But for natural events and extreme events, it's much harder to do. The, the question really is, and I think that Nati addressed this in the beginning, is, is the rate at which these extreme events in general, and cutoff lows would be one example, are the rates at which these, these extreme events changing? And, and to what can we attribute that? In other words, is there a, 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 a human source of these changes? And then if we can say there is one, who in particular is to blame? Because you also drive a car, I, I imagine, or take a bus. You also use power, you also burn coal. So very difficult to, to do any of this attribution and to, and to sue anybody. The question is really very interesting because years ago uh, at the CSR, the um, insurance industry, and that's who's really paying generally, the government or the insurance industry, they came to us and said, listen, we're suffering tremendous losses down the Southern Cape. Um, why is this? And this was actually mostly from fire. Why is this happening? And so there was a look into this. You know, there was an increase in the rate of fires, but that's generally not due to climate change. It's due to changing rates of ignition of fire, and it's due to the fact that people build in harm's way. They build places. There hasn't been a flood for 50 years. So for 50 years, nobody knows this is a bad place to build or there's bad planning. And then they build something, and then a flood does come along, and they lose the place. So it's much more complex, I think, than simply saying this is attributable. Okay, I'll stop. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, if there's anyone who wants to compare, I think we don't have time anymore now. And uh, um, I would like to thank Unati for giving us this conversation, which is really, really going on. I'm sure we will be talking behind the scenes and trying to to answer to some of the questions that came and, and, and to, to, to sort of continue with this type of work. Uh, let me say that um, I give you an opportunity to come here and again, strike a conversation about one topic that you may love to talk about. Sorry, the, sorry, 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 any parting ways from that? Oh, I think you will, <laughs> you will get it now, I think. <laughs> <laughs> He, I think he just went to the terraces. <laughs> yeah, that, that. If you want to come and, and, and say something to us That's here, we'll important. be here to talk to you. Uh, there's an opportunity. We do this one uh, once every after two weeks. For instance, now we were here on the 17th and we are here now and we'll be here in that other week, not next week every Wednesday. So if you want to come here and, and discuss something with us, if you're a PhD student, or if you're a researcher who has something that you may have discovered, or you have a paper that you may want to talk about here, we are very, very happy to come here and discuss with you that published work. Nati, do you want to say something before you close? Uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh... Thank you, Kanye. So um, I don't know, since uh, we, we, we are working together there, maybe if there are people who want to collaborate or maybe teach us something or maybe want to learn something from us, that exchange of information, they can contact us. Uh, there are many scientists here and other people who are really uh, experts in this field. So if maybe you feel like, there's something or there's a study that you need to do, you can contact us or contact anyone uh, who's part of this, or maybe they can refer you to anyone, but uh, that's all, that's all. And thanks for the opportunity. Thanks to 
to you, Gany. So thank to you, thanks to you, Neville and Access. It, 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 was, it was a pleasure. Thank you a lot. Thanks very much. Um, can you, you show, um, before yes. we close, I, I, I would like to abuse this opportunity to ask my climate specialist colleagues a question completely unrelated to anything we've discussed this afternoon. So yeah. when we finished all together, can I ask, I have a very interesting question from the Sunday Times, which I would like to ask you those people that know climate better than me. Um, so when we finish, please don't go away. I'll take two minutes of your time. I think I, I think we are finished now. Okay. There's nothing wrong. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I'll tell you, I'll tell you the story. Um, it was an email from a guy called Bobby Brown from the Sunday Times who often contacts us about climate related matters. And it was to the wind in Cape Town and um, He's doing an article on the fact that um, the crane operators in Cape Town Harbour have in the last few weeks, I forget exactly how long, maybe two, three weeks or months, they've lost 74 hours of operation. 70, a lot of time in data for operating in removing goods from, from uh, ships and putting stuff onto ships. Huge economic cost. Um, and also some ships have not docked in the Cape Town Harbour uh, over the last month because of extremely strong wind. And the question I'm asking is, is there a wind record for Cape Town with an anomaly? And can we see whether this season has been particularly an anomalous with regard to wind strength in the, in the Cape? Now, Hector, we've spoken about this before. And, and I've, I've always known that when we have very, let me put it the other way around. When there's a big storm in Joburg, there's usually big wind in Cape Town um, in the summer. There seems to be an association between rainfall in the north and wind in the south. And given that this is an El Nino year, and we've had, I think, a, above average rain and some very severe storms, it's therefore not surprising to me if this association is correct, that there is unusually strong wind in Cape Town. So my question is, one, is there such a thing as a record of wind in Cape Town which has an anomaly calculation? And two, two that there's an association and can you explain it? That's me. Over to you. Uh, uh, can you so can I? Thank you, Neville. Uh, I know there are, I, I know Tando is here. He's, he knows the dynamics of the wind better than anyone in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, at least in Southern Africa. Uh, but uh, maybe I'll go first. I, ho I hope he's still in uh, Tando. Yes. Tando will, ca will come in. Uh, he's our leading uh, expert yes. on, on the wind field. And the wind Good. field basically is the field we call dynamic meteorology. Uh, so yes, uh, want to, to begin with this uh, particular season, uh, the 2020-2021 season has been a, a very unusual season. I see, I noticed there was an invitation from Professor Baron Erasmus, the Dean of Science at the University of Pretoria to discuss this, I think in two weeks time. Uh, but I'm yes, we are, all, we, we are all interested in what really happened. Uh, the, uh, for example, in Limpopo, I would expect a lot of records were broken in terms of rainfall amounts, in, in terms of the wind, in terms of severe weather events, even in terms of the occurrence of uh, tropical cyclones. You saw we had a landfall uh, right in December, which is very rare to get landfalls in December. And we had another landfall in January and another landfall just recently in February. Uh, several landfalls and uh, most of that rainfall affected uh, the, the northeast of the country, which is, of course, the most vulnerable area the area adjacent to Mozambique. Uh, and so the, the, this 2020-2021 season is again, to some extent, is analogous to 2018-2019 in terms of being a very unusual. Of course, this was a La Nina season and La Ninas tend to be wet, but not this wet. I would really want to see the, 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 the observations uh, from the weather service as well as those from satellites, uh, like the high resolution uh, data sets we are now getting, like the chips data set. So that's something we are focusing on. In terms of the wind, we, we now have very good high resolution data. And I'm happy Tando will back me up here. We now have very high resolution reanalysis data. Uh, so, so that's something that can be done. Uh, 
uh, we can investigate. I know we have done during our, it was difficult. I know there's the Cape Doctor there, which you have uh, regularly, the, the wind coming from, from the region highs, which brings strong winds uh, to, 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 uh, to Cape Town and, and the parts of the False Bay. And, and, and so, so, so we do have the area and the data is there, can be analyzed. If there's a re research question being uh, raised, that can be analyzed. We, that we would be quite keen to, to analyze that record and try and account for, for, for the anomalies, if they are there, if they are not just perceived, uh, but if they are there, then we would be keen to account for them uh, using the very high resolution reanalysis. We do have ERA-5 reanalysis now. Uh, Nati talked about the ERA interim. Now we do have ERA-5 very high res from the ECMWF. So, so and in addition to the source observations, so, so that, that question can really be investigated. I know I have done some uh, forecasting. Uh, I did lake navigation for Lake Cariba during my time as a forecaster. I, I know the winds near, near water bodies or near coastal areas can really be tricky. Uh, but yeah, that, that investigation can be done. I, I would like Tando to, 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 to say more to this. Oh, okay. Thanks, Hector. I think it's a very, very interesting uh, issue that N Neville raised. Yes, we we, we do have um, a model derived uh, data such as era 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 five that that um, Hector is talking about, and and the good thing, as he's saying, it's it's much higher resolution than any other reanalysis product that uh, is out there. Uh, I mean, the next the next one that has higher resolution than NSEP, for example, is JRA, which could be used to, to supplement, but it's 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 relatively cause for the type of meso scale or rather the type of localized analysis that you might want to, not meso scale, but localized analysis that you might want to uh, to conduct for the kind of, uh, to answer such uh, questions as raised by the gentleman that you are talking about. The thing that I wanted to add to the discussion is, uh, you know, when you are talking about climate change and winds, one has to remember that uh, due to the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations and augmented uh, by ozone depletion, at least, let's say, from 19, uh, the 1970s, 80s, to something like 2000 or so, um, you, 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 you had a persistent shift of the mid-latitude jet. And, 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 and therefore, by moving, I would imagine, I'm not sure about this, I stand corrected, but by the fact that the the, the jet is moving towards the poles uh, as a result of this combined effect of greenhouse gas concentrations and, and, and also depletion. You might find that the winds over Southern Africa would also be, be affected by that. Now, the Montreal Protocol is now beginning to, the, the effect of the Montreal Protocol is now beginning to be observed. That is, the, the ozone recovery effect uh, is now beginning to be to be observed. So there is that now a, a opposite effect that ozone uh, recovery is 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 is, uh, is is effecting so to speak uh, on 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 the mid latitude jet. So the jet now is beginning to 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 move back towards the to towards the equator. So you have uh, 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 you know what was expected would happen actually happening now it, it was uh, it simulated a long time ago that you would have this uh, effect and and it appears as though from what i have seen that the effect of ozone depletion appears after recovery uh, it appears as if it's 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 overwhelming the effect of the uh, ozone deep of the of the greenhouse gas concentrations, and so uh, particularly in the summer, you do have this movement of the jet towards the towards the equator. I am not sure whether the the uh, the uh, the event that was observed 
in 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 Cape Town is a is an effect on that uh, is a is impacted by that, but it certainly is embedded on a trend of the jet streams moving back uh, towards the towards the the poles. I wouldn't be surprised th uh, to uh, if, if one were to do some kind of attribution study, a formal climate change attribution study, and find that it, it, it that in all likelihood, because we cannot say a particular event is caused by climate change, but we can talk about the likelihood of that particular event being caused by climate change. You might find that uh, the likelihood of that event being caused by this uh, uh, movement of the jet towards the, the equator uh, is, is, is relatively high. You know, but 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 we can't we can't say it's because of climate change or ozone recovery. We can only talk about the likelihood. Okay, thank you. I understand. I, that's very helpful. I mean, I, I, I mean, I guess I'm more interested in the sort of interannual kind of variability, and its association with this El Nino condition, and and to test whether this is an unusually anomalous mm. windy mm. season. If it's a-seasonal, for example, that would be interesting to know, you know, because I think generally we have winds, like the winds seem a bit later this year than, than they have been in the past. Usually we have wind in December, January, even earlier. Very mm -hmm. let, let, There's been very little. It's, I'd like to look at the wind patterns of this year. And then, I mean, the climate change, the, the, the climate change question is one question. And, and then the other is, you know, is this just another extreme year or is it not extreme even and I, I heard what you said Hector about it being perceived as such rather than it is and one has to check that right and then the third option is that they've got more cranes you know in other words if they if their capacity has increased over time they're having more mm -hmm. downtime because there's more cranes to be down you know so they lose 74 hours only because they've got double the amount of cranes they had two years ago you know, which would have meant that you lost 36 hours and it wouldn't have been noticeable to their bottom line. So these are all questions we can look into. But mostly mm. I'm interested to know is, is this an anomalous year for wind in Cape Town or not? That's primarily the first question I'd like to answer. I forwarded you both. And if, and if I, I would also recommend or suggest that maybe you may want to bring in some of our colleagues like the oceanographers those who are interested or looking at the land, ocean, atmospheric models, then they may also give some better insight of what is happening when we are also coupling with these currents that are also there in that division of these two oceans, which yes. are also may play a huge factor besides what is happening in the atmosphere itself. Yes. And I, as I've texted here, I know there were a couple of colleagues at CSAC who have worked on the wind atlas. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, so there look, is a bit of a in. record. Yeah. If uh, you contact them, there is a bit of They, they were looped into the original email. They were. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but if you guys have more insights, it's a really interesting question. Okay. Thank you for indulging Sorry. me. I, I, I have analyzed maximum daily wind gust for Cape Town, for not for Cape Town, for most of the stations in the Western Cape and Eastern Cape. And it's I don't only see- Overland or as well over overland, ocean. overland. I think we, we, we probably- Because there's also the element of the ocean. Yeah. Here. Okay, this, that this, I is, know, this is you, right? Yes, it's me, yes. Yeah, yeah. One thing okay. that I know is that the last time I analyzed wind, wind I think the Cape Point, wind could be very helpful here. Last time I, I analyzed it. Well, if anyone, I mean, look, I mean, the guy wants to know, he's writing an article for the newspaper, so he wants to know. Oh, okay. Last time I analyzed the, the wind from Cape Point, we noticed a shift in uh, wind directions, a slight shift in wind directions in different seasons. And then, and then what I knew also was a bit of shift of the huddle cell fall. And, and, and those are the few things that I know about this. But if I look at the wind gas, for instance, I think I open I opened my analysis here, if I can share my screen quick. 
Um, uh, I, I analyzed, I analyzed wind gust from most of the stations and I just quickly put in Cape, Cape, Cape Town here. And this is the trend that I see, but maybe it would be nice to sort of calculate the anomalies. I yeah, 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 this is exactly right. Yes, I don't see anything here. I don't see any of the things that we are talking about really. Does it look big? But, uh, this is the data from 2005 to now. And if there was any changes, then we would see some something here. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the, the highest on this graph is 2008. Right? 2008. Yes, this is, yes. No, no, I'm looking at the year 2008 in the middle of the chart. That's after 2008. Move to go, the left. Go backwards. Go back. Go back there. That's your highest. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that's, I mean, this is not higher than that. So that's interesting. This is not higher than this. I, I, okay, this is wind at a K point. Um, Airport maximum wind gust. Yeah, I'm sure we it's different in the harbor. Hey. Yes, and uh, it would be nice to get the harbor. It's different in the harbor well. because the harbor, there's a channel around the mountain, right? Yes. Let's see. Uh, Very interesting. Sorry, can I say something? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, I actually see an anomaly there, wow. but it's not as anomalous. I can't say the word, but it's not as 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 positive as as in in the two thousand and eight. But but they there appears to be some kind of anomaly. Yeah, it, it might not be as extreme, but you know. It's but because ancient. this was reported, you know, we we know about it. You might find that in two thousand and eight. You know, there might have been some event that maybe maybe more serious than the one that you are talking about now. But I can ask, I can mm -hmm. ask if we can get a wind record from the harbor because I'm assuming that if they have a limit to at what wind speed they can use their cranes, that they are mm -hmm. wind, right? So mm -hmm. I can get a wind, I can get a, a hopefully a wind data set from them um, in the mm -hmm. harbor. And we can, you know, correlate that with other winds. I just want to see if we have. I think we may. I don't know <laughs> what the resolution day. How are this, you is this is daily. No, I'm these saying at the upper. These are the stations that I have. The harbor. <coughs> the it's the harbor. This, this, this should be the harbor one, eh? This one. No, that's the airport. Oh, this is the airport. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes, you are right. This is the airport. Okay, it, it would be nice to get the airport and maybe Cape Point data. I don't have Cape Point yes, data. If we but Cape Point, can... Harbor, and, and the airport, we could correlate those three. Number one, look for an overall anomaly. Look for differences between them. That's the one thing. Nice, honest project. This we need an okay. honest project. Okay, it's fine. It's sorry, one more thing. Go back to that graph. One more thing, quickly. Okay, sorry. Go back to that graph. Um, you pointed out an anomaly. So this goes up to where? Up to like. What year is? What month is that up to? Is that? This, this, is, this, sure this, this is this is this is this is from 2005 sure beginning of 2005 to last year to when end of last year okay like, so, so that's what they've got just now right? that's february yeah, january the, february yeah, so we have the, to look yeah, at the anomaly for january february but also i want to say, as tando points out the anomaly need not be in terms of amplitude it can be in okay duration. For example, if they go over a certain limit, it doesn't matter how high over the limit it goes, as long as it goes over the limit and stays over the limit, they can't operate. So mm -hmm. in the extreme wind, it needs to be strong enough for long enough to cause a, a, an impact, which is interesting in and of itself. So we need to yeah. come okay. This Give may be thresholds. this may be smoother, Bratando. I think this may be smoother, but what we can do is to maybe take this this data. This uh, daily data, uh, oh, take daily data. What I did here, I took monthly means, and then I, I, I sort of yeah. extracted trend yeah. okay. using. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah, I was yeah. saying. We have to look at it again. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you. What, what we can do is to go back to okay. So what I did here, I, I, 
I, I, I, okay, here I was closing. Yeah, that's month, monthly, I, daily. I, I, I calculated monthly means. So what I can do quickly is to plot this data as it is and maybe take two day running mean or three day running mean if yes. you wanted to. Yes, yes, and yes. Then, and then yeah. also, um, you know, just, 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 just use, use some th different thresholds of, of wind speed. That would be one thing. Mm. Because, um, do you have up to date January, February for this year? Can you get it? Uh, no, no, I can ask the South African Weather Services to, okay. to share Let's it. That. Okay. Right, guys, I have to go. Well, thank you okay, very, no very much. We'll be in touch. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you, guys. Cheers, cheers, cheers. Okay, right. so thank you. Thank Bye. you for the presentation. You guys are not Pratando. Sure. How can Thank I extract uh, a longitudinal wave number? I've been trying to code that. Uh, 